Camp, this Party Canada. And let's give a warm, warm round of applause for Anoush Ansari. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, I want to go to space. I want to go to space after that. Okay. Our next guest is an inclusion designer, and she's the founder of We Do Something Montreal. Sophie Tarnowska designs strategic collaborations between companies and their communities, and she believes that in order to address systemic issues, tools like deep listening, courageous conversations, and civil dialogue are a must. So please join me in welcoming Sophie to the stage. Hello. Welcome oh, to Campus Party Canada. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? Hi, Good. everyone. Good. So just right off the top, maybe you can tell us a little bit about who you are and We Do Something Montreal. I know you have, I have a, a presentation. slide to help you along. Oh, well. and there it is. Um, so in 2015, I started a nonprofit called We Do Something. And as it says, the idea was, how do we do good things about bad news to help others? Um, so for five years, we do something. The idea was to you know, use what's in plentiful supply, which is the bad news, um, <laughs> as a lever to bring people together and to know one another. But then the pandemic happened. I don't know if you guys noticed. Um, and we were stuck at home, not able to act. And I realized that when we're looking at systemic change, when we start to notice the ways in which our system is broken and unequal, that perhaps the place to begin is with people, with our minds, how we view each other. So from that came this idea of versus, which is how do we improve the way we think of others so that we can collaborate together. Um, and the word versus is one that we often use as a divisive word, you know, me versus you. But in there is an us. And in the French, when you think about it, it's vers us. So it's this idea of reclaiming a divisive word to, in fact, bring us together over tough topics. Okay. Um, I was thinking about the fact that, you know, right now as we, and a lot of the things Anusha talk, uh, touched on um, really relate to this work, funnily enough, but this idea right now that we have to win mm -hmm. makes it very difficult for us to actually just pause and try and understand each other. Absolutely. Um, we're always pushed to find solutions when in fact sometimes the way to move forward is in fact just to listen as though you're researching, you know? So the idea is to build this middle ground um, in which we can actually not feel triggered because we're listening to a perspective that we don't like. Right. So this is the vision, is to build empathy back into public life. Okay. To schools, into workplaces, into public institutions. Okay, and did you have a lot of practice during the pandemic when things were getting very polarized to <laughs> put this into place? I mean, I certainly, Versus is a project that's been simmering for a good 10 years. Okay. And through We Do Something, I kept bringing communities together that didn't know one another. And I noticed, you know, how do you get groups to care about each other without manipulating, without guilting? How do you get us to care? Because we're actually watching, you know, we see the, the cost of not doing this. Right. We're seeing violence. We saw a Muslim family in Ontario being, you know, run over. Yeah. by a guy who probably never met a Muslim person in his life. So this othering has a public cost. Um, and yes, the pandemic was a sad and strong case study of that in many cases. So this, the idea of this is really how do we offer an antidote to the tribalism that we're right. seeing right now. Okay. And no problem. <laughs> yeah. How did, how have you in this work seen the way forward? What kinds of things are you practicing or asking people to practice or consider practicing in order to have maybe a healthier? Um, it's a good question. I will move forward. And I mean, first, I think we need to know what's happening. So hate crimes in Canada have risen by 7%. Um, across the country. Wow. Uh, the previous slide showed that of all the G7 countries, Canada has had the highest rates of um, killing of Islamophobia in all the G7 countries here. And it's not something we know about Canada because we're usually, it's Canada, you know, we're a great country. Um, and so what I'm seeing is that, you know, there's not, it's, 
there's two things. One is that, you know, online, we have algorithms that feed us the things we already like. Yeah. And then in public life, there's a lot less opportunity to meet one another and to cross right. paths with difference. So um, where are the opportunities for us to be challenged? Where are the opportunities for us to change our minds? It means that we end up becoming more and more wedded to our ideas as though they were our identity. Right. But your ideas are not your identity. You have multiple identities. Right. So... Um, to come to your question, so, you know, I think that there's two levels. One is to first start um, by noticing that the, the way we consume information in the world has an effect on us. Um, I would bet that if we had all done a survey on different topics at the beginning of the pandemic and we took the same questions and answered them now, we've all become a little bit more extreme including myself. Right. So that I think the question is to start um, offering people the tools to notice, hey. to not shame. Right. Um, so I'll skip past that, but I think this, is, this quote means a lot to me. It's, you know, that we have to create spaces in which there are people with whom we, in which we can disagree with the people, we can respect the people with whom we disagree. And we have a really hard time doing that. And, and that's not because we're bad people. Yeah. The internet maybe doesn't help sometimes. It, the forums online make it, it easy. It to, doesn't. Yeah. And we all feel that little joy in our gut. You know, when someone, when we read something or uh, notice something that, sh that tells, that, that reinforces our perspective, you're like, right. yes, you know, it's that little high. So I think um, another thing to know is that this, this article I found interesting, like this post, um, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue does a study on extremism, right-wing extremism in Canada specifically. And what they're saying here is that right-wing extremist groups of all kind, whether it's, you know, for white supremacy, whether it's misogyny, whatever it might be, they are very good at using social media without triggering those extreme words. Right. What they do very well is that they plant doubt about the other. They, they sort of navigate that line about, you know, have you noticed that this group is getting a lot more funding or a lot more attention? So it, it just, what we don't know often is that these ideas are being planted and all of a sudden you're like, huh, that's a good point. And now you start to look at the world through that lens. Right. So um, what can you do? Let's that was my that. next question. Yes. So I'm glad your <laughs> your presentation beat me to it. I know. Um, so the idea is there's Versus is a program with three steps. Okay. The first one is, as I said, it's looking inside. So who are you? Me, myself, and I. It's really like if someone took you to, if you went to the mechanic at the garage and he lifted the hood of your car and explained the engine to you. Okay. We do not know how we work. We don't know how much of our brains works unconsciously. We do not necessarily realize how, much of our, how many of our decisions are imperceptible to us. Right. And I think we have a lot of shame. You know, as soon as you bring up the word bias, we're like, oh God, here we go. Yeah. In fact, you know, understanding how our biology works is a really helpful tool to getting rid of shame so we can start to have real conversations and real learning about how we move into a more unified, pluralistic society that welcomes different points of view. Okay. Um, the second part is like media education. Right. Like notice and giving you tools. You know, how do you, what can you do to actually, how do you recognize disinformation? Yeah. Like if you're on Twitter and you see a hashtag that says kill the prime minister, which by the way is one of the biggest trends that have been online. Ooh. Second is uh, Islamophobia, but Trudeau must not be having fun because he's up there. Well, when you see a hashtag like that on Twitter, do we know that we're not supposed to click on it? Do you know that when you click on it, you're propagating it? Right. You know, these small things that we can adjust in our own information hygiene. And then the third part is like, where do we practice? Right. Like, how do I, know? I don't know how to debate. I don't know how to have a deep discussion. Someone needs to teach us with care, you know? So if you guys are at all interested in, you know, what you can do, it's these, there's things, you know, to understand yourself, your heritage, how does it influence you, um, to notice your world, like who are your three closest friends? Right. 
um, and not feel bad about it, but just realize um, that we all, there's a, there's a term that I'll put, sorry about the no shame zone, but it's important. It's this idea of homophily. And what that word means is that we have a natural biological tendency to seek out people like us. Like right. babies show bias at six months of age. Oh, wow. They favor the faces of people who look like them. So none of us will ever walk this earth without bias. It's, it's as essential as oxygen. The question is how we learn to notice it right. in ourselves, how we learn to respond to it differently, because you can retrain your brain to stop having the same feelings about the same kinds of people. Right. Okay, interesting. Just on a practical note, have you uh, some tips about cultivating that self-awareness? Because it is, it is really about stopping yourself and saying, yeah. oh, I'm making an assumption about someone or, oh, I'm, uh, you know, reinforcing my own bias. Um, how, do you, how do you get people in the zone of, you know, especially when we're online and we're seeing so much stimulus from everyone else, how do you, how do you sort of recommend that we stop and look in? I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't have a, like a, a cute short tip because I really think that's why there are three. It's like really, it's a program of yeah. education because I think it's too, I think one of the tough things is we're told to like get out of our comfort zones. It's another challenge. But my God, we've been through so many challenges. Yeah. Everyone's tired. So how about if someone could teach us how to expand our comfort zones so that in fact, we accompany people in expanding and noticing, because you can't change what you don't know. Right. What you're ignorant about, you're just ignorant about. And it's not, you know, so this witnessing yourself and understanding that bias, you know, is part of your life, no matter what, it will be part of your life. And, and the thing is, there are two kinds of bias. There's explicit, where you know, like, I do not like people who hate. Mm -hmm. You know, I do not like people who run through the street screaming. Um, there, the second one is much tougher. It's the implicit hidden biases, and we all have them. And you know you found one when you feel horrible when you understand it. It's right. like you dig it up and it's sh nothing comes up but shame. Right. You don't want to tell anyone about it. Very uncomfortable. So how do you create middle grounds, a space for people to find these things in themselves and not get reactive and push the whole process away? Yeah. Like, schools need this. Right. Our office needs this. Yeah. You know, workplaces need to talk about, hey, how did Black Lives Matter affect my staff? How does Me Too affect us? How does the residential school crisis, you know, how are the people that we depend on living these moments? Because it's showing up in our offices. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really like what you're saying about education and media literacy. You know, as a journalist, I really appreciate, <laughs> you know, good evidence-based, fact-based media, but um, it's getting harder to identify it. Yeah. So I'm curious um, if there are any, yeah, any tools or any sort of media literacy resources that, that you could recommend for people or... There are a lot, and I haven't listed them all because I thought my presentation was already quite long. <laughs> so I did put some tips up on the screen, okay. just simple things that I think we move so fast as we scroll. Yeah. Simple things, language. Right. Was it a protest or was it a riot? Is he a terrorist or is he an activist? Notice. Yeah. Because there is the bias. Right. Then the second thing is, you know, understand the source. I know that's something everyone says, but you know, the Institute of Global Dialogue is not necessarily a good thing. You have to go, in fact, they found that actually 95% um, of all the anti-vax information comes from 12 people. Oh my goodness. One of them is in Montreal. Oh my goodness. And they disperse content. So searching up a source, slow down. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's the type. Am I reading an opinion piece? Right. Or am I reading an article? Yeah. There's a real difference. I mean, you, you know this more than anyone. Oh, yes. My parents were journalists, too, and I was for a while. Um, your searches, um, it's one thing, I think we keep forgetting, like, when I search, you know, if I look up Gaza and Israel, based on my past search history, based on the places, the things I Google, the music I listen to, my search results will be different from someone who might have gone to Tel Aviv and might have family that's Jewish, and we have different experiences. So we'll actually be fed different yeah. articles. 
And guess what? That affects how we view the world. Absolutely. So to know not just that we have a choice in what we search for, but also to understand that there's so much we don't get to see in those searches that right. are decided for us. Right. Um, I mean, it's, you know, you will never solve this. You just have to be more aware and get better and question yourself and be more comfortable changing your mind or being <gasps> wrong. Yeah. You know? And being okay with that. Yeah, it's not easy. Like, I, I, I wrote this because I thought, you know, I don't know if we realize how often, like, these are the layers between us and each other, in a sense. Yeah. Like, my brain is making decisions about who you are and everyone around me. My heritage, like, I'm an immigrant. Um, my father was a refugee. Um, but I'm also a privileged white woman. So there's many layers of how those are my starting points when I go into the world. And they offer me opportunities to like certain people and maybe to avoid others. Mm -hmm. And I'm not conscious. The second is, who are the people I surround myself with? Because their ideas will influence me. Yeah. And then after that, it's the information diet, the people I choose to follow, the right. Facebook groups I'm on, the, the media I consume. And then the last one is the media I don't get to consume. Yeah. That might have a perspective that's just as well written and researched that I will never get to hear. And what I've noticed is that when people haven't had a chance to hear other side, when they finally do, we become so angry and triggered and emotional. So this is, Versus is also a proje uh, project to teach us how to manage those triggers. Right. And then the third part of it is like, let's, let's practice and have a courageous conversation. So yeah. let's, for example, if we were gonna talk about Bill 21. Right. Let's go there. Um, I would, Th that would t I would displace people. That's not happening in your office boardroom. Like, you will receive a text the night before, and we will do this, for example, in the basement of a mosque in Park X. Yeah. We will move into other people's spaces because that's how we get to know one another. Yeah, intentionally. Intentionally and bravely. Right. And I want it to be fun. Like, we do something, and it was always about fun. I don't think we need more, you know, shaming, we don't need more, um, like, I, I, I think we miss learning sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of which, um, I hope it's okay. I have my first question that just popped yeah. up, if we can go for it. Um, someone's asking, do you think, based on what you said about our media diet and what we're shown given our background, do you think that search engine algorithms should be regulated? <sighs> Good well, question. You know. I I, I really, I don't consider myself an expert. So, I mean, that's the other thing is Versus is very much a curation of the think tanks, the academics, the sci scientific studies that are already all working on this, but they're not talking to each other. Okay. So Versus is actually me pulling in all of these pieces with a team and making it accessible and fun, right. rather than, okay, I had to go here. So I don't have the answer to that question. I think it's coming. I will say this. I feel like right now that the internet is like, we used to be, we used to drive cars that didn't have seat belts. Yep. And the internet is the car that doesn't have a seat belt. Right. And I do think that there will have to be a line between um, free speech and hate speech, and as these groups become more adept at escaping those nets, um, us, we as citizens too will have to be better educated at a younger age. Right. It's going to have to be a little bit of everyone moving. Right. But one thing I will say is algorithms, the fact that you can go online and you do not even know how the algorithm works, that day is, I'm, I believe that the day of that is coming to an end. Yeah. I do think that at some point we will have to, as consumers of the internet, have to know how does the algorithm on Facebook work? How does the one on IG work? What, which of my, my data is it using yeah. to re search, to reflect things back at me? And what is it taking? Exactly. And do I want it? Yeah. No, that's a very fair point. Okay, thank you for answering that question. And keep them coming in the audience if, you, if, you're, if you're so inspired to to jump well, in here. I just wanted to add to, I wrote, yeah. you know, last year I used, I, I gave a talk last year and um, I kept this slide because a lot of us are making tech, you know, a lot of us are making apps and, and that's great. But I, you know, I think sometimes we forget tech is not the point. Tech is the hammer. It is the tool. And 
it will reflect the biases of its makers. Yeah. That's how algorithms work. An algorithm is essentially um, a recipe. It's like making a cake. So, you know, we, we, it's part one with part two. Like, uh, I put black boots on and jeans equals, that means she's going outside. Okay. You know, so data bias, algorithmic bias, um, these things are becoming, I think, much bigger issues that will have to be regulated in some way. I guess that is my answer. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Um, I just wanted to ask you something you mentioned a couple slides ago about the triggers that come up maybe when we enter into a space online or in real life where we're sort of confronted with our bias and you're talking about triggers, yeah. managing them. And I was just wondering if, uh, yeah, you had some wisdom to share about the management of triggers and sort of when you notice something coming up in yourself, some shame or some, you know, something that's uncomfortable, how is a healthy way to regulate that or overcome it or lean into it? I don't know. I'm curious what your take is about, about the management. I mean, it's such a beautiful question and the answer to it would solve all of our relationships, <laughs> all of our lives, right? I think, honestly, again, I come back to that first part, which is understanding once you know your, your own stuff, yeah. Um, you can understand, like, like it, it's, it sounds cheesy to say, but there's a reason. The better you understand yourself, the more open you are to understanding others. Right. So if you're in that space, then you might go, oh, God, I can feel, you know, you, you, you're used to noticing, like, I am freaking out internally, and I want to punch this person in the face, and that's not good. <laughs> so I think I'll take a breath, or I'll say to the person, I need a minute. I, I'm like, I'm really feeling this. And most of us never stop to f think, where do I feel this? Yeah. And it's right here, or it's right here. Like, mm. you need to breathe, and it actually brings the nervous system down so you can engage. But you're allowed to step and say, we need to come back to this. Yeah. And then ask yourself, why am I so upset right now? For sure. Why I, do I feel attacked? Yeah. And I think, too, maybe because things well, are happening online or in a social media sort of digitally mediated space, we forget about our bodies and listening to our bodies. Um, but, but I'd say also, and I want to add this disclaimer, if you're someone who's being targeted, if I'm a, a black woman and someone from a, a white supremacist hate group is talking to me, that's not your duty. Like, no. your duty is to protect yourself. It's yeah. not, and I, I also think it's, you know, you shouldn't, it's not a should. I think we have a really enough shoulds when it is right for you and you are ready to engage. And there are some people who are not worth engaging with because you know there's no, there's no exchange. There's no curiosity. Yeah. But if we can engage with one another, um, curiosity is a really good armor. Yeah. It really is. Because if you just keep going, well, why is that? You know, oh, and and not this. to taunt someone, yeah. but to say, you know, but why, where did you learn that? And why do you believe it? What do you think the impact of your belief is on the people around you? Yeah. It's, you know, it's just, but it's tough work. It is. But it forces people to go a few layers deeper than the in initial knee-jerk reaction. Um, I like that a lot. I've got a, I don't know how many slides you have left. but I don't I, know either. Okay. I think we're there. <laughs> Well, one question I had right off the top um, that we didn't really get into is what sort of inspired you in 2015 to um, start We Do Something Montre or Montreal and, you know, to decide that, you know, you're going to do something about all the bad news you were seeing. <laughs> um, I'm just curious if you can a tell a little question. bit more of, about that origin story. Um, I know we all remember when that three-year-old... Uh, little boy, Syrian refugee, Aylan Kurdi, drowned. Yeah. That was, yeah. for me, the moment where I thought, I am so tired of despairing behind my screen. Yeah. Like, we had a lot of hashtags. That was hashtag time. A lot of hashtag activism, which isn't a bad thing. It's just I had a need to be in community with other people who felt the same despair. And I also wanted to raise money past pressing on a screen. Like, yeah. I wanted a different kind of philanthropy. You know, it's nice to donate on a website or go to a gala dinner or join a sports team, and those are all worthy things that raise money, but what they don't do is connect us to one another. Right. We never get to sit in the same room and know each other. Yeah. So we do something was like, well, 
what if instead of asking people to change how they do good, I went to find them where they already are? They go out for dinner. Yeah. They make time for that. They have a budget. Why don't I work with cool restaurants? And we did Lawrence. We did Grumman. We went to like beautiful places, and I made it cool and yeah. fun. So you know, then people are open because they don't feel assaulted with, you know, you should do more for others. It's really like going to meet people where they are is the heart of both these projects. Yeah. And then I, you know, I had to give a TED talk, a TEDx talk, and they ask you, well, why did you build this? And I realized then, it's like you don't know sometimes what motivates you, and that's about knowing yourself. That's when I realized, oh yeah, my dad was a refugee. Like details that are important. Right. You know, my stepmother's Lebanese. She grew up in Beirut in the war. Um, my gr grandparents were fleeing Poland. Right. Um, because the Germans were coming, and so for me, like indigenous issues, refugee issues, like people being left out, uh, whatever color, size. It's like I, I don't know. Yeah. I, maybe it's in it's in the heart where I'm just like it's not okay. Yeah. Um, and I felt I you know I came here when I was a little girl, but I always spent my holidays where my dad would work. So Beirut, uh, communist Poland, India. So I was always kind of an outsider. Yeah. Who didn't speak the language. Mm -hmm. So I feel a lot for people who are left out. Right. It's it's. Well, and it's inspired some very, very amazing projects. So at least you're turning it into fuel for something, you know? I hope. That's bigger than you. Yeah, I'd like to find a workplace that is open to being my first uh, prototype. So if anyone is interested, Ooh. there's an opportunity to prototype versus for your team. Um, but it's really meant to be, this is really about not shaming and really about like helping people walk out feeling like, wow, I really have expanded my sense of myself and of my community. Okay. So, you know, we started with ourselves. We moved to sort of the external stimuli around us. And, you know, we landed on these courageous conversations that we need to be having with each other and seeking out. I'm curious, um, this might seem simple or maybe, you know, we have to hire you, but how do you have these conversations? Who should be having these conversations? Where should we be having these conversations? Mm -hmm. What are you proposing with Versus here? I love that. Well, as I mentioned before, for example, in workplaces, um, right now, McKinsey just came out with a study that showed that in the next 18 months, 40% of the people surveyed were thinking of leaving oh, wow. their jobs. There's a really high attrition rate. And you know, we forget, I think the pandemic is a, was a collective trauma. Yeah. Like it, by definition, we never talk about this. 9-11 is an example of a collective trauma. Yeah. Hiroshima, these are moments that affect a large part of society and they change the law or policy. They make massive changes in society. So 9-11, for example, changed transportation. Forever. We don't travel the yeah. same way. What will the pandemic leave us with? And I think one of these things is people sort of quitting a self-care. Mm. We need to have these conversations for people's mental health at the office. How do you leave space? And I think offices, companies are afraid to do this because they don't have the solution. Yeah. And they need to reach certain objectives. They're not here to be a therapist. At the same time, if they could have these um, moments where people have a space to express what keeps them up at night, yeah. they're... It, it, it sort of deepens their sense of belonging, right. their sense of being heard. And the key to be heard is to be seen. Right. If you listen to people, you often don't have to solve more than that. Making sure someone feels heard is the step towards really like connecting. Yeah. So workplaces, schools, issues of say consent yeah. for teenagers, you know, these are rules imposed from above the, the school here, this is what's bad, we'll punish you. But teenagers have their own way of dealing with these issues. Yeah. How about we let them own the topic and make up their own rules at the beginning of the year? And right. they have to align with the school rules. But yeah. how about we have an explicit conversation and those teenagers define what it means to them and then define some rules? Yeah. So, you know, Montreal has had so many, I don't know if you guys saw Ballarama Wholeness, was received these horrible racist remarks. But tons of municipal um, elected officials have not renewed their elections because they're being Targeted. viciously attacked. Yeah. So even for, for cities, 
How do you structure conversations with citizens so that we look each other in the eye, but these are controlled? Mm -hmm. Versus is like a recipe. Drop your topic into it, and we will handle and create a constructive outcome yeah. where we can crowdsource what we're hearing. Yeah, yeah. So it's about creating space, literally physically space, creating the conditions to have these tough conversations. Um, creating the people, too. Yeah. Like giving us a way out, giving us a space to like... Work know, it out. I mean, if you ask someone to go to the gym and, and lift a 300 pound weight, that's what those conversations are. It's a 300 pound weight. Yeah. You need some training. You need some learning. Yeah. And maybe a guide, right? Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of which, how can people find you, follow you, connect with you and... Ta -da! Oh, there we go. Oh, that lined up so perfectly. It did. We're so good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I invite people to sign up. Um, we have a newsletter on our uh, website. The website's up there, but also any other way. Um, and we will be launching Versus very, very soon. So if you're interested, sign up for the Great. website well, and follow well, us. Thank you so much thank for you. coming to Campus Party Canada and talking about this project and the importance of, you know, uh, civil dialogue and you know my being more human because I think you know we're all technologists and students but we're all humans uh, you know first and foremost so it's really important uh, to create and generate this humanity so thank you so much for your work thank you um, let's give her a round of applause Thanks. thank you thank you <laughs> and you can leave your clicker here if you feel like it <laughs> is next on the docket here. Um, je voudrais maintenant inviter l'hôte de le prochain panel sur la scène. Disons bonjour à Azid. Thanks. i